Good day. I'm Stephen Lee, an elder at First Presbyterian Church in Mesquite, and I'm also the teacher of the Discipleship Sunday School class there. We're continuing our lesson today with the book of John. This is the ninth lesson, and today we'll cover verses 5 through 8 of the first chapter. Now, I told you that this first 14 verses of the book of John was like a mini New Testament and that we would be studying it in great detail. So let's get started. John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Here we meet another one of John's key words. This word occurs no less than seven times in the gospel. To John, there was a darkness in the world that was as real as the light. And the darkness is hostile to the light. The light shines in the darkness, but however hard the darkness tries, it cannot extinguish it. Those who sin love the darkness and hate the light, because the light shows up too many things. It may well be that there is a borrowed thought here. The great Persian religion of John's time influenced people's thinking, and it believed that there were two great opposing powers in the universe, the God of light and the God of darkness. There was a battleground in the eternal cosmic conflict between the light and the dark, and all that mattered in life was the side that you chose. John is saying to us, into this world there comes Jesus, the light of the world. And there is a power, darkness, that seeks to extinguish him. But there is a power in Jesus that's undefeatable. The darkness can hate him, but it can never get rid of him. The unconquerable light will, in the end, defeat the hostile dark. The darkness stands for all those who hate the good. It is those whose deeds are evil who fear the light. But it is impossible to hide anything from God. There are certain passages in the gospel where the darkness seems to stand for ignorance, especially that ignorance which refuses the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, one of those great metaphors in the book of John. He goes on to say, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. He also said that he came with his light so that we should not abide in darkness. Without him, we cannot find or see the way. And there are times when John uses the word darkness symbolically. He tells how the disciples had embarked in their boat and were crossing the lake without Jesus. And then he says, it was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. Without the presence of Jesus, there was nothing but the threatening dark. To John, a Christless life was life in the dark. The darkness stands for life without Christ, and especially for that which has turned its back on him. One Christmas, my brother Randy asked everyone to tell what Christmas meant to them. Of course, a lot of the adults said family, church, and home. And the kids said toys, candy, and Santa Claus. But my niece Carissa said, I've been thinking about the light and darkness a lot lately, about how the light pushes away the darkness, but the darkness cannot push away the light. I think that is what Christmas means to me, that Jesus is a Christmas gift of light from God, and it guides us all. I'll never forget that Christmas and Carissa's insight into its meaning. John 1, verses 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light 
so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. In the fourth gospel, every reference to John the Baptist is a reference of depreciation. And there's an explanation for that. John was considered a prophet, and for 400 years the voice of prophecy had been silent. So certain people were fascinated by John the Baptist, and they gave him a higher place than he ought to have had. It was not that the fourth gospel wished to criticize John the Baptist or that it underrated his importance. It was simply that the gospel wanted to show that John was a prophet and not the Messiah. John is careful to say that John the Baptist was not the light, but only a witness to the light. He shows us, he shows us John denying that he was the Christ, or even that he was the great prophet whom Moses had promised. When the Jews came to John and told him that Jesus had begun his ministry, they expected John to resent this intrusion. But the fourth gospel shows John denying that he was first and declaring that he must decrease and that Jesus must increase. The gospel writer knew of the tendency to give John the Baptist too high of a place and took steps to guard against it. Now let us examine another one of the key words in the fourth gospel, the word witness. The fourth gospel presents us with witness after witness, eight, no less, to the supreme place of Jesus Christ. First, there is the witness of the Father. Jesus said, the Father who sent me has himself borne witness to me. He meant that in his heart, the voice of God spoke, and that left him no doubt as to who he was and what he was sent to do. Jesus did not regard himself as having chosen his task. God chose Jesus for that task. Second, there's the witness of Jesus himself. He said, I bear witness to myself, and my testimony is true. This means that his life here on earth was his best witness. He claimed to be the light and the light and the truth and the way. He claimed to be the Son of God and one with the Father. He claimed to be the Savior and the Master. If his life and character had not been what they were, such claims would have been shocking and blasphemous. What he was himself was the best witness that his claims were true. Third, there's the witness of his works. He said, the works which the Father has granted me to accomplish bear me witness. When John speaks of the works of Jesus, he's not speaking only of his miracles. He was speaking of Jesus' whole life. Fourth, there's the witness which the scriptures bear to him. Jesus said, search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. All through the history of Israel, people had dreamed of the day when God's Messiah would come. They had set down their ideas of him. And now in Jesus, all these dreams and hopes were finally and fully realized. Fifth, there is the witness of the last of the prophets, John the Baptist. He came as a testimony to bear witness to the light. The prophetic witness to the coming of the Messiah culminated in John the Baptist. Six, there is the witness of those whom Jesus came into contact. The woman of Samaria bore witness to the insight and to the power of Jesus. I love the way she describes Jesus. She said, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Can he be the Messiah? And the people who witnessed his miracles told of their wonder at the things that he did. 
Throughout the gospel, there was always a great crowd ready to bear witness to what Christ had done for them. Seven, there's the witness of the disciples and especially the writer of the fourth gospel itself. It was Jesus commissioned to his disciples. You also were witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. The writer of the fourth gospel is a personal witness and a guarantor of the things he relates. Of the crucifixion, he writes, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. At the end of the gospel, he writes, This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things. The story he tells is no secondhand tale but what he had seen and experienced himself. Eight, there is the witness of the Holy Spirit. When the counselor comes, even the spirit of truth, he will bear witness to me. To the Jews, the spirit brought God's truth to people, and the spirit enabled them to recognize what truth, that truth, when they saw it. It is the work of the spirit in our hearts which enables us to recognize Jesus for what he is and to trust him for what he can do. John wrote his gospel to present the unanswerable witness that Jesus Christ is the mind of God fully revealed to all people. Thank you. And this is Thanksgiving week, so I thank you. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. God bless.